Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. I'm your host, Paul Vogelzang. As part of our Smithsonian Associates Partnership Program, our guest today, Dr. Alexandra Lord, is chair and curator of the Division of Medicine and Science at Smithsonian American History Museum. Dr. Lord is a former professor. She's founded two websites, Beyond Academe and The Ultimate History Project, written several books, won awards for said books, is working on two more books. Honestly, Dr. Lord is truly talented and it's a pleasure to hear from her. I'm going to be talking about the 1920s in America and public health. It's an incredible decade because it emerges out of World War I when a lot of changes in how people perceived of health uh, were occurring in the country, but it was also a time of tremendous change in the United States overall. We're talking about things like uh, the emergence of the war. We're talking about mass immigration during this period. We're talking about growing interest in women's rights. That, of course, is our guest today, Dr. Alex Lord. Dr. Lord will be speaking at the Smithsonian Associates program titled Doctor's Orders, The Growth of the Public Health Movement, June 26 at the Ripley Center, Washington, D.C. And we'll have links up to Dr. Lord's impressive bio, her websites, her books, etc. But she's here with us today. As all Not Old Better audience are interested in and committed to health matters, you'll love this interview. Join me in welcoming today via Skype to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series, Dr. Alexandra Lord. Well, uh, Dr. Alexandra Lord, Lexi, uh, please tell us briefly about yourself and just briefly about the program that's coming up at the Smithsonian Associates, June 26, 2017, entitled Doctor's Orders. So I'm a historian of medicine, and my area of specialty is the history of public health. I'm going to be talking about the 1920s in America and public health. It's an incredible decade because it emerges out of World War I when a lot of changes in how people perceived of health uh, were occurring in the country, but it was also a time of tremendous change in the United States overall. We're talking about things like uh, the emergence of the war. We're talking about mass immigration during this period. We're talking about growing interest in women's rights. Um, this is the period when they begin to get the right to vote. We're also talking about um, some breakthroughs in understanding of public health that are really being implemented. And public health itself actually receives a fair amount of funding during this period. If you look at the history of public health over the 20th century, it ebbs and flows in terms of funding. And the 20s is a period when there's a fair amount of funding for public health. Well, Lexi, why did you become a historian? Why not move in kind of a health professional direction? Well, I'm really interested in understanding why things are the way that they are in the United States. Um, and while I think public health today is really interesting, I think a lot of the decisions, a lot of the health outcomes, a lot of the practices and what we might call medical traditions that we have here in the United States really come out of the past. And for me, I really want to understand why we are the way we are. And I think history does the best job of answering that question. Um, I don't think history can predict the future. In fact, I know it can't, but it can help us to understand who we are, how we got here, and how we might change or even how we might maintain the status quo, uh, or if it's important for us to think about what we did in the past and maybe we need to do something similar again. What was successful in the past? What was not successful in the past? Have things changed uh, since that period? And if so, how does that influence our decisions about what we're going to do? I've read articles by you in which you say that demolishing myths is what historians do. What are some of the myths about public health? Well, I'm not really sure often that people even know what public health means. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a big sort of question mark that people have. What is public health? Um, what has it been in the past? Um, has it even existed in the past? There's a tendency, I think, especially with topics like medicine and science, for us to not 
not to really see these things as having a history, but the history of public health in the United States, for example, is incredibly deep-seated. Um, in 1798 is when um, the U.S. government actually began to get involved in providing health care hmm. for uh, a certain group uh, within the country. It was actually um, merchant marines, so seamen. Uh, but there was a push way back in the 18th century. It was very much an Enlightenment idea uh, that you needed to care for the population. This was tied to the desire for economic growth, to have um, a healthy group of individuals who could participate in the transportation of goods, also to make sure that trade networks weren't also networks that spread disease um, and that, that there was a fear that that would be damaging uh, to the country's economy. So I think one of the biggest myths, especially if we're talking about the history of public health or the history of medicine, is this idea that the government's involvement in medicine is something new. Uh, it's not. It's been there right from the beginning. Um, but there are a lot of myths that are sort of more broadly speaking we see in the context of the history of medicine in general. People don't always understand what people understood about the body in the 19th century or even into the 20th century. Um, sometimes people depict medicine as sort of the bad old days of medicine um, when doctors didn't know anything and they were always bleeding their patients uh, and patients were dying from being bled. It's not quite that simple. Um, it's actually a much more complicated story. Um, and one of the other things that we tend not to be aware of, or a, it's not necessarily a myth, but it's an unknown element, is that there are unique aspects of American medicine that really sort of follow our national history. Um, we tend to think of medicine or science as not being influenced by cultural factors, uh, but of course they are what we decide to study, the kinds of diseases that we think about, the things that we worry about, those are all a product of cultural and social factors. One thing that is definitely credited to public health, and certainly it's our, our country's recent history, recent in, the, in terms of the last century, and that is that life expectancy has increased dramatically. 25 years have been added to the, the people here in the United States. So historically, what did we do right there and what could we have done more of to have even increased the life expectancy further? Well, one of the biggest things that public health does is it's actually involved in some basic things in, that we would think of as cleanliness or hygiene. So getting people clean water, uh, making sure that human waste, for example, is properly cared for, that it's not infecting or rolling in the streets, uh, if you want to be sort of blunt about it. Um, and those are some of the great breakthroughs uh, in terms of public health. When we think about sanitation and the push for uh, better sewage systems, better water filtration systems in our nation's cities, um, and that really begins in the late 19th century, um, and that's when we begin to see some shifts. Uh, in life expectancy during this period. Um, there are some other breakthroughs. Sometimes they might be a medical breakthrough in that we develop a better understanding of how to control and contain a disease. So something like uh, eradicating a disease like smallpox, which was especially deadly uh, in the United States. And it's especially tied to American history because, of course, at the time of contact, um, smallpox was one of the diseases that actually decimated the indigenous population. Um, um, so controlling and containing smallpox, and that began in the 19th century, moved into the 20th century. Um, that's also one of our great uh, successes. Controlling and containing epidemics in general has also been something that we've made tremendous progress with, understanding where a disease breaks out and then how to stop and contain it uh, so that it doesn't spread into other communities. Um, that's been an extraordinary breakthrough over the course of, I would say, the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. It's been a learning curve for us, and we've developed more and more sophisticated techniques over time. Um, and that's another reason sort of for this great change in our life expectancy. But there are also simple things like caring and providing better care uh, for women when they're pregnant, making sure that children, young children in particular, receive health care, um, and that the population in general 
receives a good education about public health risks. Um, so public health is often about balancing the greater good against individual rights, but it's also about educating and informing the population so that they understand the risks of their behavior. We are with Dr. Alexandra Lord Lexi. Dr. Lord is going to be at the Smithsonian Associates June 26, 2017. Dr. Lord's presentation will be on Doctors' Orders, the Growth of the Public Health Movement. Lexi, thanks uh, for, for being here. I, I just could talk to you for, for a long time. I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about the public health maybe change in focus and, and attention as a result of it being considered, or the lack of public health being considered a threat to national security. So... Uh, we can see this. I'm going to be talking specifically about the 1920s. And if we think about the 1920s um, and we think about the turn of the uh, 20th century, so World War I, um, when World War I broke out, the United States needed to draft a large number of men. Um, and when they began to do the draft, they began to perform medical exams. Uh, and this was the first time that many people underwent a medical exam, a basic, what we would see as a basic routine medical exam, a kind of checkup. Um, and what they discovered was that a lot of the American population uh, had major health issues. Um, some of those issues might be a lingering disease, which would mean that the soldier might or sailor might be knocked out of um, unable to participate in activities during a specific periods. Um, so, for example, uh, venereal disease, rates of venereal disease were very common in America in the early 20th century, and there was no cure for that disease. There were also high rates of tuberculosis as well among potential drafts, uh, draftees. There were also, um, you know, issues with underweight, undernourished potential draftees. Um, sometimes people had suffered childhood ailments so or nutritional deficiencies. So sometimes uh, potential soldiers or draftees suffered from things like rickets, uh, which would have made it difficult, if not impossible, for them to perform their duties uh, in war. Um, so there was an awareness uh, during World War I that we didn't really have the best fighting force, the best potential fighting force, uh, and there were concerns about how we could better care for Americans to ensure that if a war did break out, we had healthy men who would be able to fight um, the war. The Smithsonian Associates presentation uh, by you on June 26 is going to offer discounts for students. I, I know you come from academia, but what in particular would you say to anyone interested in, um, in a career as a historian uh, around public health or as public health as a career? What, what are the skills that you see that are necessary today? I think that public health experts and historians actually have a fair amount of in common uh, with how they think about things. I think of both of us as detectives. Um, public health experts are detectives tracking down the source of a disease and then struggling to contain the disease. And historians are always tracking down sort of the source of information about an event that happened in the past. Um, both public health experts and historians are always dealing with incomplete or problematic data. So we're always having to make inferences. It's like putting together a big puzzle piece. Um, so I actually think there's a fair amount in common between what public health experts, um, in particular epidemiologists, uh, who are the ones who track down the cause and the origin of a disease, and historians do. There's So I think you know, if you are considering something like going into medicine, studying and thinking about the history of medicine can actually be really helpful to you. The skills that you might develop um, can be really helpful to you if you do enter the medical profession or the public health profession in particular. We as a society have witnessed some terrible atrocities throughout the world related to hygiene and water. Is third world water and indoor plumbing and hygienic conditions the next big public health battle? I'd say it's a public health battle here in the United States mm. because, of course, we're thinking about lead in the water mm, here right. in many of our cities. 
um, and public you know, uh, access to clean water has been one of the reasons why we saw those great jumps in life expectancy in the United States. Um, so I think this is actually a global problem, but it's not, you know, when we say global problem, we tend to think it's not something in the United States. It's something in the United States. We need to be ever vigilant. Public health has been tremendously successful, um, so successful that we're often able to forget about what we might consider those, um, and I'm going to use this phrase here, the bad old days, the days when life expectancy was low, the days when uh, you couldn't just turn on a tap and expect clean water. Um, if we're not careful and if we're not ever vigilant and if we are not looking at and making sure that we are funding these activities, then it's easy for us to slip and not fund them, and then we're just one sort of heartbeat away from a potentially um, significant public health disaster. It's easy for us to fall back. And as a historian, I have to say, one of the things that you see is often you see sort of ebbs and flows, successes, and then uh, falling back, uh, and then, you know, stepping forward again with more successes in the field of public health. But then you see a series of crises as perhaps funding is pulled back for these kinds of initiatives. Um, we tend to think of you know, public health, um, life expectancy, and sometimes we even think of history as just a tale of progress, and it's not. It's a story of fits and starts. Uh, and so understanding that in the context of public health and seeing issues like this issue about clean water on a global scale, seeing this as something that um, is not just happening outside the United States but has the potential to happen here as well, I think is really important for us. Lexi, I have just two more questions. I know you're very busy, but you've written um, you've written a very interesting book. I, I haven't had a chance to read it, although I, I did find a couple of really great summaries. You won first prize, actually, for in the popular medicine. <laughs> Congratulations! This is really really a, a a wonderful award for you to to get. The name of the book, Condemnation. Uh, is this excellent historical account of the past 100 years of sex education in America. <laughs> and I wondered if you would talk a little bit about kind of this notion that with all of America's hang-ups and uneasiness about sexual behavior, there have got to be ways to kind of balance the message on this subject without sounding too shrill or alarmist. And I wonder if you could tell us a couple of stories from, from your book that kind of give us an example of what that what that really is. Sure, and it, there is a real danger of sounding shrill or alarmist. In fact, the Public Health Service, partly because they've been doing this for a long time, the United States Public Health Service is the agency which oversees public health initiatives in the United States, but the Public Health Service recognized that, you know, creating a sort of alarmist tone, it can be effective in the short run, but in the long term, it's not very effective in changing people's behavior. So we always need to keep a really balanced approach to when we talk about uh, sexually transmitted diseases, when we talk about rates of teenage pregnancy. Um, we need to be very measured, and we need to be consistent in the message that we're sending. I mean, that's, I think, one of the biggest lessons that we can learn from history. But I also think it's important for us to be aware that this isn't a new problem. When I used to teach, I always used to joke that um, we always think that sex is something that just originated with our generation, and sex out of wedlock is something that originated with our generation. Um, these things aren't true <laughs> in the past, and particularly in the 19th century, prostitution was much more widespread in the United States um, in that Victorian era. So the spread of disease, um, venereal disease, was actually uh, pretty common and pretty widespread. Um, so when we talk about the history of sexually transmitted diseases, this isn't something that emerged in the 1960s. Uh, it's not something that even emerged in the 1980s with the AIDS epidemic. It's something that's deeply rooted in our own history as a nation. And understanding that, I think, is really crucial if we're going to take a very measured uh, and clear approach uh, to how to best eradicate and deal with sexually transmitted diseases. And even um, sort of the uh, corollary to that, high rates of unintended pregnancies. Alexi Lord, presenting on Doctor's Orders, your passion and your 
uh, professionalism, your expertise will be on display on uh, June 26th. I also found uh, a great website that you co-founded titled theultimatehistoryproject.com. And I wonder if you'd maybe tell us a little bit, is there a renewed interest in history now? I definitely think so. I I would like to believe that people have always been passionate about history because we want to know who we are and where we came from. But I think in the past, I would say about a year or so, uh, there's been a lot of questioning about what are our traditions, what are our political traditions, what are our educational traditions, what are our religious traditions. I think these questions are really first and foremost, uh, in our national dialogue in the past year in a way that they haven't been for a long time. Um, And I think they're really central to understanding where we're headed. We can't map out a plan for the future unless we understand really who we are. And to understand who we are, we really need to look back um, and see who we have been. Uh, how we have changed, why we have changed, and what those changes mean for our national uh, culture and uh, just a broader national conversation. Well, Lexi, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, This is an important subject, and it's going to be wonderful to see and hear from you on June 26th at uh, the Smithsonian Associates presentation. We'll put links up to all the various places where we can find out more about you, including ultimatehistoryproject.com. But thanks, Lexi, for joining us today. Really, this is uh, is great, great stuff to be talking about and thinking about. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 